we don't have a swimming pool, we just have a bird bath. It's not very practical. <laughs> well, today we're uh, back in the book of Acts and uh, we're going to see the influence that the occult had on the ancient world. Now, in the West, uh, we're heavily influenced by what we call philosophical naturalism. So we don't take the occult very seriously. Uh, we tend to confuse it with uh, fantasy and fiction, like Harry Potter, for example, or Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings, uh, maybe The Force in Star Wars, or even The Wizard of Oz with The Wicked Witch of the East, I think it was. It's a great movie, that. But fantasy books and movies are not the occult. Uh, occultists are people who claim to have found the hidden key to the supernatural control of nature and events, okay? It's a branch of paganism that worships the creature rather than the creator. And it attempts to control the creation uh, without God, okay? And so, for example, uh, wizards and witches would try to convince us that by using uh, spells and potions predictions and tricks that they have the spiritual power to work miracles and many take them seriously and believe in these hidden powers so like any ideology it affects the way that they think and the way that they act and it isn't anything like harry potter and it isn't anything like gandalf uh, to them this is not harmless fun uh, but deadly serious power now, because we don't believe them, right? And by that, I mean we don't put our faith in them, okay? However, many do put their faith in the occult, and that's why it can be dangerous and why uh, it needs to be taken seriously. Uh, so, for example, I'm just reading a, a biography of Adolf Hitler. And uh, did you know uh, that the Nazis were influenced by occultic thinkers and theories? Uh, Heinrich Himmler and uh, Rudolf Hess, for example, they used the occult to justify many of their opinions about racial superiority. Hitler often consulted his own horoscope for reassurances to make sure that he was doing the right thing when he was trying to take over Europe and, uh, and Russia. Um, so who knows? what our politicians might believe out there. Uh, for sure, they don't believe in Christianity, okay? But they do believe for sure in uh, spiritual things, religious things, political things, philosophical things that affect their daily lives, okay? So for example, I was thinking, what, what does Putin believe that caused him to invade uh, Ukraine? I mean, that's a great question to ask, isn't it? Uh, what do Canadian politicians believe that caused them to make the decisions that they make that affect us? What I'm saying here is that we all have an ideology that controls our thinkings and actions, even though we might not know it. Now, I'm, um, World War II, I guess, is a, is, a, is a stark reminder of that. It confirms for us that any system, any worldview, uh, when believed, can have devastating effects upon the whole world. And the occult is no different. Uh, we, don't, we don't trust in it, but many other people do. And uh, we live with those people, and they have an impact upon us and upon our families. Now, of course, our, our ideology as Christians, our doctrine, okay, is found in the Bible. And the Bible, we'll find, takes the occult very seriously. It condemns its practice and its practitioners, telling believers, that's us, to reject them. Now, it does this not because occultists can really predict the future or because they can really read the stars or because they can somehow communicate with the dead. The reason the Bible condemns it is because it states that they are controlled, these people are controlled, and the occult is controlled by deceptive spirits that blind their minds to the, blind the minds of those who trust in it. The Bible is clear. The secret things belong to the Lord, because uh, in order to control the future, you'd need to be able to control the present in every detail. And of course, we know that demons can't do that. We can't do that. Only God is able to control the present. Isaiah states this, 
So why are you trying to find out the future by consulting witches and mediums? Don't listen to their whisperings and mutterings. Can the living find out the future from the dead? Why not ask your God? And our God, of course, uh, in the Bible, has revealed all we need to know about the future, and that's where we should go to. So if you're interested in the future world and what's going to happen to us all, then I would suggest that you study the prophecies of Scripture. Uh, this is a great way to great place to go because there are hundreds and hundreds of prophecies that have been made in Scripture, and they've already been fulfilled in history. So we can go back in history and we can confirm the fulfillment of them, and that will give us confidence about the future prophecies about the world to come. You see, as Christians, while we believe that man can produce lying wonders, we also believe that only God can produce true prophecies and true miracles. And this is why we believe in the miracles of God and not in the magic of men. So today, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at an example of the clash between Christianity and the occult in the ancient world. I think it will help, be helpful to us because it will put us on guard as we see the occult gaining more traction here in Canada, and it will also show us the power that we need to combat it. Uh, you see, one of the problems in the West today is that we've uh, kept the demonic ideas of the past, but we've tossed away the power to defeat them. So let's pray together as we begin our message today. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, your word tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Lord, make us aware of this battle of spiritual ideas going on all around us, and help us to recognize the good and reject the bad. Help us to recognize the true and reject the false. We pray this sincerely in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Okay then, so first, uh, to resist the occult, we need to be aware of its power. This is chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced mag magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that he's called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. Now, we may not realize this, uh, but the occult is actually all around us. Uh, we were in our prayer meeting today, and Steve Chu mentioned this, funnily enough. But uh, my wife and I, we, go, we try to go for a walk every day to keep ourselves in reasonable shape. And uh, we often walk past a section of Danforth Avenue. It's amazing because along that, that section, there's, there's a couple of um, businesses that advertise psychics who will read your palm for a fee. And I, I'm truly amazed that people would go into these places and actually spend good money on this service. Well, many of them do. Uh, it, it, it's clear uh, from these uh, examples that many desire spiritual insight, but without God, okay? That's the difference, okay? They don't want insight that God might give them. They want insight from the spiritual realm without him, and that's a very important point to make. Uh, Ramey's brother, um, he was uh, what I would call a kind of a mystical Buddhist, and uh, I remember one time uh, we were watching TV and there was a Kung, Mu Kung Fu movie on. And you know when the Kung Fu uh, artists, I mean, I think they're great, right? They're great in the athleticism. But sometimes they leap over houses. Have you ever seen that? Have you seen that? That's kind of, wow, that's really weird, right? Uh, they look like a cross between Superman and ballerinas. <laughs> and then, of course, I laughed. I laughed when I saw this. But he, he, he was kind of offended at me. He said, oh, no, no. He said, there's, there's real power in this, and these things can be done. So even in our supposed scientific age, right, uh, magic is still believed by many people out there, even though we might not ourselves believe it. Of course, in other countries, uh, the occult is more evident and has a greater hold on the minds of the people than it would do here in Canada. And we've all heard, for example, of voodoo, uh, transcendental meditation. We've heard of witchcraft. We've heard of fortune telling. We've heard of spiritualists, necromancers, Satanism, 
and there are many other things that you can go into when you're talking about the occult and this affects both men and women because they believe in it and so they are kept by satan from seeking after the true god so we as christians we take the the occult seriously dealing with it seriously we don't try to ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist no we have to deal with it because it does exist and it's out there now in simon here we see the characteristics of an occultic leader and uh, it's important to identify such leaders so for example an occultic leader will have a high opinion of himself as simon considered himself here somebody great do you see that now this is the sign of any false teacher it takes great self-confidence to be a confidence trickster uh, most of us wouldn't be able to pull it off because we couldn't brazenly deceive others without stammering and feeling ashamed of ourselves but there are people out there who are really good at it so beware of people who speak confidently about secret insights and mystical powers uh, there are even christian mystics in fact in the new testament when it started uh, there was a, a, a cult called gnosticism and, and one of the this was one of the first christian heresies and they promoted the idea of hidden knowledge about god that only the initiated could know in fact that's what the occult means the word occult actually means hidden secret or concealed uh, so it, it, it's not uncommon that people for people to confidently boast that they've been endowed with these powers okay that can reveal mysteries to us that the normal person doesn't actually know also an occultic leader will work hard to amaze people with his powers simon held many both great and small it says here under his spell uh, the word amaze here means to astonish to confound like a clever magician will do sometimes for us again an occultic leader will seek to dazzle us with tricks instead of enlightening us with the truth and this sense of wonder uh, caused many to trust in these charismatic leaders uh, this is because people are always looking for easy solutions to their problems okay and this is why confidence tricksters are successful uh, they uh, are often brazen li liars and the bolder the lie that it seems the more likely it is to believe because people when they're in trouble when they're in difficulty when they're afraid they will grasp at straws okay that's the way that human nature is however we don't need tricks like this what we need is the truth and the truth is not hidden but it's re been revealed to us in jesus christ and in the revelation of the bible and that's why we take the trouble to come here each sunday and actually open up the bible and try and find out what god has to say to us furthermore from simon we learn that an occultic leader will accept the worship of his followers uh simon uh, apparently didn't try to rebuke the people for saying that he is the power of god uh, now if you contrast this with the apostles the apostles were doing real miracles very powerful mir miracles and the people then wanted to worship them as well and they tried to but the apostles rebuked them and wouldn't accept their praise okay and i mentioned hitler before he he mes mesmerized the german people and they from what i've been reading in this biography they basically worshipped him they worshipped him including most of the church leaders and the people in the churches that's how it was so successful they so hitler so enchanted the people that the people went to war believing him to be some kind of a messiah of the german people that's why it all happened read the history and this is what simon was involved in he has somehow convinced the people that he is some kind of a demigod so what i'm saying is that we shouldn't dismiss the occult as silly superstition okay be aware of the powerful hold that it can get on the minds of people secondly secondly to resist the occult we must rely on the preaching of the gospel this is chapter 8 verses 12 to 13. <clears throat> when they believed philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of god and the name of jesus christ the samaritans were baptized both men and women even simon himself believed and after being baptized he continued with philip and seeing signs and great miracles 
and great miracles performed. He was amazed. Excuse me, just let me. <clears throat> so Philip here, he comes to these Samaritans who are, are under the influence of this, this uh, magician or sorcerer, and he preaches Christ to them. Uh, so the power of the gospel we see is the antidote to false systems of thought. This power is found here in the name of Jesus Christ. And this is our only power. And this is important because there's been times in church history, again, if you read history, when the power of the state is united with the church and they've actually burned witches at the stake. We've all heard of this, right? And they even claimed that the, the church authorities claimed that they did it to force these witches to repent so that they would be saved as through fire. That was the reasoning behind it. They were trying to intimidate them so that they would repent uh, of their, their, their sin. But here we see that with Philip that the gospel alone is what saved, set the Samaritans free from this fault, these false ideas and the power of, charism of this charismatic leader. And this is why when we preach, what do we do? We hold up Jesus Christ. Uh, we can only overcome false teachers and teaching with the one true teacher and teaching our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our weapon. So uh, by talking about this today, <clears throat> I'm not saying that uh, we should study all the difficult esoteric kind of occultic ideas because this oh, it, it's unlimited. I, I just couldn't uh, find, I found so much stuff about it that I didn't know what to include in the message. Uh, but what we should do, instead of studying that, that, that stuff, what we should do is study our own faith carefully. It's the knowledge of Christ that is our only weapon against the claims others make against our faith, okay? And that's the only person that we need to trust in is the Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep us safe as we know him and as we depend upon him. You know, if you're going to fight a duel with swords, and then what you've got to do is learn how to use your own sword properly, okay? Let the other guy worry about how he uses his sword. You only worry about your sword, and that's what we have to do here. The point I'm trying to make here is that it's the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ, not the power of the state or any other power that is our only weapon as Christians. So we need to learn of Christ if we're going to get the message out there. And here, of course, we see the power of the gospel working in the Samaritans, and not just in the Samaritans, but also in Simon himself. When he sees the real miracles, not his tricks and his deceptions, when he sees the real miracles, he is amazed, and he believes himself as well. Therefore, we must be sure of what we believe, okay? Uh, for the simple reason that we have to defend our faith against attacks. And who can defend truths he doesn't know? And who can resist lies he doesn't recognize? So master the truth of the gospel. That's what I'm trying to say. And you won't be uh, charmed by false gospels. Now, thirdly, <clears throat> to resist the occult, we must seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. This is verses 14 to 19. <clears throat> Now, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So here we see that uh, Simon notices the difference in his magical powers, as it were, and the powers of the Holy Spirit. So much so that he becomes a believer in Christ and gets baptized. Now this tells us that the miracles of, of Philip were not psychological tricks, okay? Uh, like you sometimes see on the TV evangelists uh, telling us about the miracles that don't happen when they give their, uh, their services. Nor was Philip a master manipulator like Simon, who is trying to fool the people in some way. Now, Simon 
he was a master manipulator and he recognized the truth. He recognized the real power when he saw it. He knew that this was the finger of God and he wanted that same power for himself. Now this tells us that real miracles won't just cure the deaf and the blind and the paralyzed, but it will also shake the souls of those who witness them, okay? Those who saw the miracles in the New Testament either declared that they were the work of God or they declared that they were the work of demons. No one had any doubt about the supernatural cause of the events that they were seeing. Simon here is just one example. Now, the passage here presents some problems for experts on the Bible. Uh, Peter and John uh, were sent north, right, to lay their hands on the Samaritan converts and give them the Holy Spirit. So the question arises among the experts, well, were the Samaritans truly saved if they hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit? Now, there's several views on this. Some would say, uh, that they were not saved, okay? They were not saved until they'd received the Holy Spirit. So th this, and we still have these teachings today, would mean that a second work of God is needed, uh, that is the receiving of the Holy Spirit is needed before a person can be truly be saved. So, so the, the, the message would be, okay, you've got to believe in Jesus, then you've got to be baptized, and then you've got to have another work, you've got to be, uh, uh, receive the Holy Spirit before you can actually be saved. And some charismatic groups do actually teach that. Not many, most of them don't, but some of them do teach that as well. And, uh, you know, we need to be on guard against that. Now, others say that the Samaritans were saved, but the gift of the Holy Spirit was delayed, okay? And it, he was delayed because the Samaritans had to know that salvation was from the Jews, okay? And so uh, to show that the church was one church, you know, that there wasn't going to be a Jewish church and then a Samaritan church and then a Gentile church. What was needed was the apostles to show the link of the two churches together so that the Samaritans and the Jews would know that God wants just one church, not many. Another solution is that the Samaritans truly believed and were saved when they believed in the name of Jesus and were baptized, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit in the same way that the apostles received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The apostles, we, are, we know when they received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, were true believers in Christ before that happened. Uh, but they were given at that time the power to speak in foreign languages and to work miracles. Now, likewise, the Samaritans here had been saved by the converting power of the Holy Spirit, but they didn't have this miracle working power. To get this power, the apostles had to come and lay their hands upon them, giving them the Holy Spirit and passing this power onto them. Now, Philip had experienced this because you remember he was a deacon in the Jerusalem church, one of the seven, and they, the apostles had laid their hands upon him. So he had the power of working miracles, and that's what we see him doing in this context here. So the reason we don't have uh, I would say these powerful manifestations of the Holy Spirit today is because the apostles died off and they could no longer lay hands upon anybody and pass this gift on to people. And I think this is confirmed by what Simon says in verse 18. He says, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And we see that he's even willing to pay for it. Uh, now, <clears throat> now, though we don't, have the power to do miracles today. And I wish I did have the power, but I don't. But though we don't have the power to do miracles today, uh, we do need the Holy Spirit in our hearts, okay? It's the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, that convinces us of the truth and helps us to identify false teaching and false teachers. So our faith must be informed by the Holy Spirit as he applies the truth of the word of God to our hearts, okay? The power of faith is knowing who, in whom our faith is placed, okay? Because we are saved not by our faith, but by the one that we believe in. So if we believe in the wrong one, if we're depending upon the wrong thing, then we are depending on the power of that person or system. You get what I'm saying here? Occultists have faith in their system 
with its spells and its potions and its mysteries. We have faith in Jesus Christ with his sacrifice, his resurrection, and his open revealed promises. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals Christ to our faith in all of his power and his beauty and his love. And so we're protected from other systems of faith, and we're also challenged to put our faith into practice in our life. And this leads us to the next point. This is four. To resist the occult, we must have a right heart. And this is verses 20 to 23. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the goal of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So when Simon offers money, money for the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, Peter is shocked. And he tells him, you, you've, you've got neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. And Peter also says, your money perish with you, indicating the great danger that Simon was in. Now again, as I've studied this, uh, the experts are divided in, the, in, in what's happening here. Um, and now, was so they asked the question, was Simon a false believer or was he just an ignorant believer? Okay, this is something for you to study when you go home, all right? Now, the first group, they, they speculate that if his con conversion was insincere, uh, he, what he's doing, what Simon is doing here, he's jumping through all the Christian hoops to reach his greedy goal of getting the power like Philip, okay? Uh, so Peter here, when he says that you're going to perish, uh, is implying that, uh, that Simon is heading for hell. And in fact, uh, the Phillips paraphrase of the Bible, which is an excellent read, but the Phillips paraphrase of the Bible, it translates this verse like this. It's quite shocking. You and your money can go to hell. That's what it says. And, uh, and that, that shows you the bias that paraphrases can sometimes have, right? A paraphrase is more interpretive than a, than a literal word-for-word -word translation. And so it can be quite dangerous because that's not what the Greek said at all, okay? On the other hand, if he's a true believer, and the Bible says that he believed, and it says that he was baptized, then when Peter is talking about him perishing, he's talking about his body. His body would die, but his soul would be saved. So I guess uh, you can go home and think about that and take your pick which one you like. Either way, Peter tells him to repent. And this is something that we all must constantly do. In fact, the first point of Martin Luther's 95 Thesis was that the Christian life is a life of continual repentance. You see, if every time we fail the Lord uh, or misunderstand his teachings, if we're not allowed to repent and find forgiveness and correct ourselves, then we're all in danger of physically perishing every day. So, <clears throat> fifthly, to resist the occult, we must be constantly turning from the wrong way. And Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel uh, to many villages of, uh, of the Samaritans. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm assuming uh, Simon's sincerity here. But Simon has a real regret here, it seems, uh, for his wickedness. Uh, so we, we see that repentance then is admitting that we, we've got things wrong, okay? Simon was wrong about the occult, and he was wrong about the Holy Spirit, and he's clearly shook up uh, by the reaction of Peter, and he regrets offering money to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. Simon also asked Peter to pray for him, which is a good sign of repentance. Pray for him that God would have mercy upon him. He believes that he's facing the judgment of God, and he seeks mercy from God. And that's another good sign of repentance. He knows his sins, uh, sin, he fears the consequences of his blunder, and he wants God to save him. Okay, now this is what we do when we pray, you know, forgive us our trespasses in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we know that we've fallen afoul of the justice of God, and we are seeking his mercy. 
And I sometimes wonder how many bad consequences have we avoided because God is merciful to us and answers our prayers every day. Now, sadly, uh, this is where the story really ends. So I can't tell you if God spurred Simon's life or not. I suspect he did because I, I think that surely uh, Luke would have recorded if, if uh, Simon had died, just like with Ananias and Sapphira. Remember that story? That was another tough one, wasn't it? Uh, but the Bible here is silent about what actually happens to Simon. However, church tradition says that he became a dangerous false teacher among the early Christians. And we have some fabulous stories from the second century uh, because, that say that he started his own Gnostic, remember Gnosticism? He started his own Gnostic cult, and they, uh, they were called the, Simoni the Sim Simonians, the Simonians. And uh, uh, this writer actually said that they, these, this, this group is still in existence to this day. So <laughs> it shows you. But if they're wrong, all right, if they're wrong, and he did truly repent, he didn't make the same mistake again. And this is another part of repentance. Uh, we turn from our sin and we avoid the same fault. Uh, there's a humorous story from 1812, and uh, it was a, an English Quaker was excommunicated from the church because he married a non-Christian woman who denied the Trinity. But he was readmitted back into the church after he went to the, ch to the church congregation and declared this. He said, though out of courtesy for my wife, I can't say I repent of marrying her, but I can sincerely say I will never do it again. <laughs> so repentance is not uh, just in word, but it's also in deed, okay? And I hope that Simon was a real Christian and that his repentance was sincere and he became a good Christian. And the lesson for us, of course, is that our repentance and our faith in Christ must be real. And also we should take hope because if God will save someone like Simon, uh, then why can't he save us as well? So in conclusion, in conclusion, uh, again, I, I, I know <coughs> that, that none of you are in danger of falling into occultist claims and, and trickery, uh, but, but this doesn't just apply to occultists. It applies to all false teachers, and we're all in, in danger of that. As Paul warns, uh, they can bewitch us with different gospels, and that's what we have to be afraid of. Remember ideologies. We, we, it's a class of ideologies here, and they can bewitch us with their ideologies and stop us trusting in the grace of God and, be, and cause us to start trusting in our own good works, uh, maybe the works of the law, okay? Now, I was born uh, near Liverpool, England, and uh, at that time, when I was a child, the Beatles were just becoming popular. And you might uh, not know this, but John Lennon, in, uh, in several biographies, had, there was a time when he actually made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And what was happening was that John was listening to Billy Graham on the TV, and he was so impressed that he claimed at one point to be saved. And he even wrote a song uh, called You Saved My Soul. And I did listen to it. It's never been published. And, and I listened to it, to it on YouTube, and I'm not surprised it wasn't published because it's not good. And it's, but, but his wife... Uh, Yoko Ono here, uh, she didn't like this, this drift that, uh, uh, or this phase, if you like, that John was going in, and so she resisted him, and his wife won the battle, and so John uh, went on to, to write, you know, the famous song, Imagine, you know that one, you know, Imagine There's No Heaven, It's Easy If You Try, No Hell Below Us, Above Us Only Sky, uh, and, and also at the same time, uh, John became extremely interested in the occult, uh, until he was uh, shot by this crazy man, okay? His last days, John's last days, were controlled by astrologists, astrologers, numerologists, clairvoyants, psychics, herbalists, and tarot card readers. The lesson is this. Uh, these first century occultic tricksters are still out there, even though we might not believe in them, they're still out there, they're still out there, and they can gain a powerful hold on those who put their trust in them. So let's ensure that our minds are captivated by Christ and the gospel, 
and that we are filled with the Holy Spirit who will teach us the truths about God from his word. This will protect us from people like Simon the sorcerer. Now, one way that the Holy Spirit protects us is by focusing our minds on what Christ has done to save our souls. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't just make claims like Simon. He actually acted and he went to the cross on our behalf and his body was broken for us. And this is important because as I was studying for this message, I had to read a little bit about witchcraft and Wicca. And uh, I found out that, that uh, witches or Wicca, uh, most of them don't believe in sin. And, uh, and so as a result of that, they don't need a savior, right? If you don't believe in sin, you don't need a savior from sin. And also most of them believe in some form of reincarnation. And so death to them isn't a punishment. It's kind of a, a, a kind of a psychological or biological recycling. Jesus' death, therefore, doesn't pay the penalty due to the broken law. Death to them is just a natural event. We, however, as Christians, we do believe that it pays the penalty for the broken law, and we remember this as we take the bread and the wine together. So I'm going to ask uh, the servers if they could come and uh, come forward and help me. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just take a moment, if you would, a uh, moment of silence just to examine your hearts. We're going to take the communion now. And uh, if, if you're not yet a Christian, okay, if you're not yet a Christian, you're not yet been baptized, uh, please be patient with us. Uh, the order in the New Testament is that we believe, then we are baptized, and then we take the communion. And that's why we kind of, uh, we, we, we kind of limit this, not, not to be mean or anything like that. So I'd ask the service to come forward, and I would ask us all just to take a moment of silence. Heavenly Father, we, we confess that there are many strange ideas out there. Some of them uh, seem crazy and wild to us. Uh, but Lord, we, we pray that you would help us to, to understand that these uh, ideas can be dangerous to, to many people. And Lord, we have, we have uh, the truth as revealed to you, to us through uh, Jesus Christ in the Bible. And we pray that we might be strong in resisting these false ideas. And also that we might uh, use uh, uh, the understanding that we have to help, help other people likewise to see the, the problems with these cults and uh, the occult, that they might realize that uh, sin is real and death is real and that we all have to deal with it one day. And so, Lord, I pray that, they, that we would be able to point them to you and to Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior. We thank you that as we come together like this, we can remember what he's done for us, how that he's body was broken and his, his blood was shed so that our sins could be forgiven. We're truly thankful and we, we, we want to uh, lift our hearts in, in, in total thanks for this great blessing that you've bestowed upon us. Help us, Lord, to get this message out to others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.